MLS Aces Podcast, episode 210. This is your host, Tom Sweezy, and I am joined by Vaughn Fullman and Jason Vivang. Vaughn, you are not wearing a long sleeve LAFC kit, but how are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm, I'm so happy you guys are back. Uh, I do not miss uh, the hosting chair, so Tom, thank you for being back. <laughs> you know, I've been a guest on a few podcasts before, and it is so much just not easy. It's just so much more relaxing to be the person not in the in the driver's seat. But I guess I'll, I'll take it since, you know, I, I started this whole thing. And Jason, how are you with your Liverpool FC hat? I'm pretty good. Um, I will say when you're hosting, though, like I feel like sometimes as a co-host like i'm just kind of dozing off um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have to stay focused That's what you really do that like i feel like people don't realize how focused you have to be for the entire length of the podcast whether you're hosting or not i mean it, it's just like constant pressure, not pressure. you know you're welcome <laughs> you're, you're welcome to everybody to everyone listening you're welcome no, I'm just kidding. also yeah um, vaughn has a disguised uh short sleeve jersey yeah, yeah. this is very, this, very this, disguised <laughs> This is a fake. Disguised. <laughs> he apparently got the jersey for like six dollars too, and it's just mind blowing. Yeah, you got to look at all those like discounts on MLSsoccer.com. <laughs> not, not that I'm like pitching for them to like have more sales there, but uh, yeah, I'm fine I with them sweet, having more shit sales. I got this sweet <laughs> LAFC jersey from MLSsoccer.com on a super discount. It's kind of cool they have the YouTube logo. Yeah, well, and that. it's like a high quality kit. I kind of really yeah. like it. Like yeah. you know, it's legit. I, I like I it. Can I have YouTube to... TV at my apartment, and I don't think I get like you would think you would get LAFC games if that's their. Oh sponsor. yeah, there'd be like an ex- like at least some deal. I don't know. Maybe you would think, but no, I don't get them. And whatever. Um, let's talk soccer. I guess that's probably why we're here to talk a little bit. I'm a little bit um just out of it today. This week, you don't want to talk know. like uh, Jersey sponsors. No, no, not yet, not yet, not yet, Jason, not yet. We, we, don't, we don't bring that up yet. Okay. Come on. Um, the first thing I do actually want to bring up is I just want to say a quick little uh, rest in peace to John Madden. I know, like, it's been, like, a little bit of a week since he passed away, but just, I don't know. I feel like to give the guy who did a lot in kind of making talking about sports fun john madden if you guys didn't watch the documentary nfl coaching legend nfl commentary legend obviously video game legend uh passed away i think last week like i said and you know just it sucks a big fan of him in multiple categories and he was definitely a pioneer in kind of um again going on tv and making sports not just really talking about oh number one passed it to number two touchdown right like he made things fun he talked about you know like some guy making a joke on the sideline or whatever it may be so definitely want to give a quick rest in peace to john madden also probably if he didn't come along and make the nfl as popular as he did maybe major league soccer also isn't in the place that it is today in 2022 so just a quick little MLS tie there. But um, quickly rolling over into us, MLS Aces as a podcast. Um, thank you guys for watching this live. Thank you guys for watching this on Twitch, following us on social media, Twitter at MLS Aces. All of our Twitter handles are underneath our names. If you guys are watching on YouTube or Twitch, um, you got it, Jason. Yep, you guys both <laughs> did, did it. You, exactly both, both, you guys both did it. Um, <laughs> That's really weird. Ugh, I don't like that. Uh, also, Instagram is um, just MLS Aces. And if you guys want to learn a little bit more about us, read any blogs that go up on the website, www.mlsaces.com is where you can go to learn more about us there. And kind of like what Jason alluded to before, the MLS Aces podcast and MLS Aces as a whole is brought to you guys by Soccer90. And you guys can make Soccer90.com the primary source for all your Major League Soccer, U.S. national teams, men and women's international club gear, jerseys, scarves, hats, and more. You guys can definitely check that out and pick up something sweet awesome i've picked up quite a few things i actually picked up this sweatshirt that i wish i had on me it's in it's in that room over there <laughs> next episode i'll remember to wear it it's really cool to dallas burn 
Um, it's a oh, nice sweatshirt. Man. It's like red and green split in half. Really cool. I'll wear it next episode. But I got that from Soccer90.com. And you guys can get something cool like that as well because you are an MLS Aces listener. And since you are an MLS Aces listener, watcher, whatever you are, you guys can receive 25% off your purchase when you use promo code um, MLS Aces at checkout. That's MLS Aces. MLS A-C-E-S at checkout. So thank you to Soccer90 for sponsoring this episode episode of the podcast of the show boys let's talk mls u.s soccer u.s men's national team because we'll probably dive a little bit into some implications there as well this episode let's start with coaching hires um the final two managerial spots in the major league soccer have been filled for the 2020s or heading into the 2022 season um jason houston or lafc which one you want to start with uh lafc Okay, LAFC. They have hired uh, U.S. Men's National Team legend Stephen or Stephen Steve Chirundolo. Um, He has only has one, I guess, year of managerial experience underneath his belt at the first team level. Last year, he managed the Las Vegas Lights FC in the USL Championship, who were, you know, pretty much the development club for LAFC. So, pretty much an in-house hire. 32 games for um, them managed last year, six wins, three draws, and 23 losses to his managerial slate. Don't want to hold a managerial record against them too much, but Jason, you picked LAFC to start with. Let's talk to Ron. I mean, don't we kind of have to hold a managerial record against him? <laughs> I, I feel not like gonna, I think he when basically you look at the got a picture, promotion no. for being bad at his job. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, if you do the math, he has 21 points in 32 games. It's uh, 60 point, point six five points per game. That is horrible. I that's horrible. <laughs> I, it, it's very bad. The, look, the record. I think when you look at the record face value, it's not a great. It, it's not a great hire if you're just looking at you know 23 losses in 32 games straight up looking like that in his only season as a first team manager. But I think when you look at the situation he was put in, Las Vegas is not set up like um, like a Phoenix Rising or an El Paso Locomotive or a club like that in USL Championship where, you know, he's working with different players every single week. He's working with loanies from LAFC. He's working with, you know, with, with very young kids. He's not working with seasoned veterans. And I think that's probably a large reason why he lost a ton of games. Um, I think the number that I'm more concerned about is the goals created, uh, or sorry, yeah, uh, goal, goal chances created stat that I saw. And he was like minus 16 on that or something. Like that's a little bit more concerning that the style of play didn't lead to at least, you know, True. more potential goals created, not even goals finished at the end of the day. But Vaughn, you're rocking the LAFC kit. How do you feel about, you know, I guess, you know, your 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 club tonight's new manager? <laughs> uh, well, I, I think we talked about it on a couple of episodes ago when we knew Bob Bradley was leaving for sure, which yeah. is this is going to be the second era for LAFC, right? So I'm most interested to see can this guy that they brought up through their system in a, in a way lightly um, can he carry on and continue what was being established in LA? Um, this is a team that obviously last season did not go as planned, but Trundolo is going to have a lot at his disposal, but this is also a team that is operating a little bit differently, right? Like Bob Bradley was very heavily involved in player selection. He was very involved in uh, everything top to bottom for that franchise. So there's going to be a new way of doing business for LAFC and Steve Trundolo. I'm excited that we're having this, you know, former U S men's national team guy step in and get his first major coaching opportunity uh, in MLS. Right. Like, I think that's a good thing in that there's still this mix of like, all right, we've got the Ezra Hendrickson's that are the assistant coaches that are getting elevated We've got the guys that are coming from overseas, uh, but then we also have these other guys that are getting their first real opportunities to prove themselves, uh, you know, in in the U.S. sports landscape, right? Like they're, these players, these former players aren't just falling to the wayside, right? Like this is where you look at it and you're like, hey, is this the way that we have future guys uh, that have been on the national team, like a Beckerman or a Ramondo? Like do they eventually mm-hmm. make their way uh, to, to the, the coaching ranks? And uh, I, I, for LAFC, I hope that Trundolo doesn't like fall flat on his face 
in this gig. <laughs> I, I wouldn't look too much into the USL record because mm-hmm. to me, you, we he didn't have a lot of time there. Uh, he's operating within a system that, you know, Las Vegas was not set up to be LAFC's minor league team until last year. So I think there yeah. was a lot of moving pieces in trying to get there. Um, a lot of change in philosophy, obviously a new coach there. Um, and, and obviously he wasn't involved in the player selection for that squad. So I think I'm going to give him a pass there. I agree that, yeah, the chance creation is maybe a concern, but I think that's typical of a lot of the two teams. Uh, when I say the two teams, I mean like the MLS second teams, yes. right? Where the, the independent sides tend to do a little bit better because they're operating under a different structure, under different mm-hmm. goals, so on and so forth. So yeah, for LAFC, I, I'm optimistic. I hope that they can you know right the ship and get back to what they were because I think the league is better for that. Uh, is Chirondolo the guy to do that? Only time will tell. And that's kind of where I wanted to just pick up with the Chirondolo conversation is clearly Las Vegas, I don't think, is a clear indication of his expertise, his ability as a, as a manager in professional soccer. It's a it's a little bit of a tell, I think, when you have to look at style of play, chances created, everything like that. But I, I'm not going to sit there and look at that and be like, you know, he's not going to be a good soccer coach because because of what he did with Las Vegas. Um, you know, obviously he came up through the youth ranks at Hanover over in Germany. He was an assistant at many different levels there from the first team down. He was an assistant at Stuttgart as well. And, you know, playing his entire professional club career in Germany as well. I have to think Trundolo has learned a little something working with with young players and that's where I'm a little bit confused because I don't ever feel like I think LAFC as a development type of club. You know, they're the Carlos Vela, they're the Diego Rossi. Let's go out, let's get Edward Atuesta, right? Like, let's go get that star, that 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 big name or that sexy player that's going to come and score goals or, or be a sleek defender or whatever it may be. So I don't know. Like This seems like maybe a type of transition away from we're going to go out and sign Carlos Vela and now we're going to develop the next Carlos Vela. I feel like you could potentially look at it that way. I don't know if the ownership's going to go that way. Trundle is also a big name in U.S. soccer, right? U.S. players, they know who Steve Trundle is, the U.S. M&T legend, right? He's the, the one club man, the stud right back, like all that stuff, right? So there's a lot of positives to it. There's a lot that worries me about the Trundle hire. I guess only time can really tell. Jason, I, I, I feel yeah. like um, it's just like a weird hire, kind of like what you're saying. It it just seems to me like LAFC is obviously losing Bob Bradley, who many consider to be I don't know, top five managers currently right now um, in MLS. So it seems like kind of to go off what you were saying about, you know, they're hiring a guy that – this will be his first job in MLS and it's sort of a, a big step and it goes a little bit away from what I think of when I think of LAFC because yeah. they're in LA. I mean, they're a big name team. They hit the ground running right away. They were great. They're able to get these uh, really high quality players. There's a lot of money flowing in um, and flowing out. So yeah. Celebrity I mean, owners, all that stuff, right? It, I guess on the one hand, it's like he has this opportunity where he's got a good backing where, you know, if he wants someone and he can kind of pitch what he wants, maybe it becomes really successful. But it's also it seems like they probably would have wanted to go with, a, I don't know, a bigger splash in terms of manager going from Bob, Bob Bradley to Steve Chirundolo is kind of not as exciting as I think when my mind thinks of LAFC. It's kind yeah. of like this high high pace, you know, fast, just like a pretty massive team. And I mean, this is what their fourth season, third, fourth season. And I think it's their fourth or third. Fourth. Yeah. Fourth. Fourth. Um, and Thanks, it, it seems like <laughs> they, since they joined, I mean, they've been a, a pretty big force and obviously, you know, the, this last season, they sort of underperformed. And I feel like if you go from a season where you underperformed into a new coach, it can be a little risky. Um, in terms of like, it could get a lot worse. Yeah, and no, I don't exactly. think I don't think they have the luxury to just like dive bomb and be one of the worst in the league. 
The one thing that I will say benefits them from not getting a lot worse is if Carlos Vela is healthy on the field yeah. playing, right? If he doesn't want to play for the team anymore, if he still has some of his issues that he he was having last year. I wonder if they you, consulted some of those big name players. In, maybe. In yeah, I, it's 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 interesting because right now I look at the LAFC roster and I'm not overly concerned about it. There's obviously holes. Edward Atuesta is a huge hole that, that they lost lost this offseason. But I it's not like the roster's bad still. No. Like defensively, I think they're strong. I think you sign a D mid, you sign a goalkeeper, and pretty much you have a team that can if they perform up to par, make the playoffs in the Western Conference, in, in my opinion, um, as it looks right now, right on paper. But, you know, it, it also really is going to come down to Trondolo's style of play. You know, maybe some of the youngsters he did work with um, on loan at, at Las Vegas, he kind of has trust in to play some, some major depth pieces for the upcoming season. I don't know, it, right? We can take as many guess, guesses as we want, but yeah. it's really going to come down to what we see on the field next year in, in 2022. Well, I think also, right, we've seen different teams succeed different ways, right? Like signing the big name didn't work out for Atlanta in getting Frank yeah. DeBoer or Gabriel Heinze, yeah. right? Like that that didn't do anything. Or we, we can even look at the different moves that the Galaxy have made, uh, you know, with, with under Teclosa and, and trying to bring in a, a bevy of different guys to try and fill the hole. Yeah. Um I think bringing in the big name doesn't solve the problem. You can just as easily find a Wilfried Nancy that steps in and can get results in MLS. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is their way of saying, no, we're going to trust. We, we brought this guy into our organization to process. run our two team, trust the process. <laughs> uh, and, and let's, let's do this a, a different way. And let's, let's not go spend big on a manager that may or may not fit our system, our style, our players, whatever. Um, it, or maybe they know it's a, hold over a year i don't know um but but I, I think it's at least good that we're seeing some other domestic uh coaching talent making it up to the to the head coaching positions and houston dynamo fans don't worry we will talk about your hire as well even <laughs> though maybe you get even less sexy with that hire but the one thing that i want to say about both LAFC um, and the Houston Dynamo hires is I have a little bit of a trusted source that I want to obviously keep anonymous, but they told me that both hires for LAFC and Houston were not the first choice hires. Well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. We're not the first choice hires for both clubs, that there were other options out there that kind of fell through potential last minute hires and that LAFC and Houston both went with quote unquote in-house hires for, um, for, for, for their next options as manager heading into the 2022 season and beyond. So in saying that, let's chat about Houston because they did finish up the, I guess, the, the head coaching um, carousel by signing Paulo uh, or hiring Paolo Nagamura as their next manager. Um, Nagamura is an MLS legend. He won a lot of games, won a lot of trophies as a player within MLS for the past, I think, five years. And Vaughn, maybe you can correct me because I know you're an SKC fan. He has been managing SKC2 in the USL Championship, 118 games managed, so definitely way more um, USL games managed uh, than, than Steve Terundolo. But 31 wins, 26 draws, 61 losses in his managerial career there. Super young head coach. You're definitely giving a guy like Nagamura um, his first, you know, again, real shot at a, at a major first division club. Um, I guess, Vaughn, I'll start with you. You know Nagamura. He's been coaching your, your second team for a while. I guess, how do you feel about him getting an MLS shot? I mean, I'm ecstatic that he's getting an MLS shot just as a fan of his and, and watching his playing career uh, with sporting. Um, and, and yeah, his managerial career at SKC too. Um, it's, it's very similar to Trundolo in that it's somebody that is staying, you know, in, in the U.S. soccer sphere and getting a chance. Um, definitely unexpected. I don't think anybody was expecting him to move on from SKC too and to get an MLS job. I don't think yeah. his name was being thrown out there that much. Um, but as a player, you know, like I, I loved his aggressive style. I loved his, I, I, I think he can definitely be a, uh, a player's coach. Right. And Nagamura uh, also is coming from the Peter Vermese coaching tree. Right. Like, I think this is the other thing that we still have going on of like, there's the Siggy Schmid and Bruce arena, Bob Bradley, Peter Vermes, like th those are starting to be like the predominant trees in, uh, 
in U.S. coaching soccer, I would say. I would um, even throw Schmetzer into there as well she, because Schmetzer, Schmetzer is yes. now even breaking off into his own because he's coming from the, the Siggy <laughs> Schmidt trade. It's crazy. That's op- that's absolutely fair. So, you know, that's what I'm saying is like, like we have these guys that are coming from these channels. And I think that teams like Houston see that and say, hey, we got to have somebody that is from one of those trees that's getting some of that experience, is bringing that locker room experience yeah. in, into our locker room. Um, so for Houston, I hope that he can come in and mix things up a little bit, right? Like, obviously, it didn't work out for Tab Ramos, uh, much, much along the same lines of Terundolo, right, uh, of what could turn out happening there. Um, for, but for Nagamura, same thing. It, it's going to come down to if he gets enough time to make something happen uh, and if he gets the support of ownership. I think that's the other big difference for Houston is the spend compared to LAFC, right? Like you're, you're, you're going to need to have a significant amount of roster spend to get Houston turned yeah. around. And I, I don't think they're that close yet, uh, regardless if it's Nagamura or anyone else. Um, they, they need to support the coach. And Jason, before I, I turn things to you, the, the only thing I want to say about the Nagamura hire is that, you know, reports were coming out the past few weeks that Nagamura was getting lined up to be Dynamo 2's um, head coach in, in MLS Next Pro. And apparently a few weeks later, things turn out where he is the Houston Dynamo first team manager. A big question mark around there for me because I never saw anything or heard anything lining him up with the first team gig, only the second team gig. So that has me a little concerned as well. Um, but Jason, I'll, I'll turn things to you. Comment about Nagamur in general, the yeah. rumors, reports, whatever you want to go for. I mean, so it worries me a little that he he's like rumored to be, the, you know, their fourth or fifth choice, just because in a team, you know, in Houston that, like Vaughn was saying, needs a lot of help, right? You're not going to turn it around in, in a month. So I do like that, you know, he's a 38, he's only 38 years old, which is kind of crazy. Um, I know. <laughs> like when I saw that, I was like, wait a second, this is the same guy. <laughs> um, but the, there's a potential for him to really build something there. And he really needs the, the ownership and everyone to just give him time to implement his process, his players, you know, and that starts maybe with how they're doing training and then it goes into games and it, how they're spending and they don't, I don't think necessarily need to come out of the gates and be, you know, a top five team in MLS. Uh, I really hope that they're able to give him a little looser leash, give him the support he needs so that he can establish some type of culture there, something to build off of. Because if you're switching coaches every single year, you're switching entire ideologies in it just becomes all muddled up and it's very hard to make progress that way for a guy who's 38 years old. I mean, this is a really big career move and could be really great. It just worries me because if he's not their top choice, if let's say like their number two choice opens up, are they going to just punt and say, Oh, he opened up and he wants to come here and bring this guy in and, I think that would actually be more negative for the organization as a whole. Um, and maybe they're not, maybe they're, they're fully in on Nagamura. Um, and I, I honestly just hope they are because I think given time, we could see him, you know, develop like you guys are saying in these coaching trees, maybe he creates his own. I mean, given enough time, you, you never know. Yeah. So I, I guess um... I have not a lot of positives to say about this hire. I'll be very honest and and start with that. But the one positive that I will start with is that this is the first hire underneath Pat Onstead, underneath Ted Siegel, now that Siegel is the majority owner. This is the first managerial hire. Clearly, Siegel, Onstead, the rest of the ownership, the rest of the, you know, the, the leadership executive staff felt felt confident with Nagamura going forward and, and wanted to make that statement that he is their first managerial hire underneath this new kind of group, underneath the new logo, the new team, everything like that. That, that is the one positive. Work out. I, I, that's, that's the one positive I will say, Vaughn. Yeah. yeah. Fire would like a word. <laughs> Well, also, the other ladder that he falls under is 2009 Chivas USA. So mm. that was a, that was a team that was coached coached by Precky and yeah. then uh, had Jim Curtin, J- 
Jesse Marsh, and Paulo Nagamura. Oh, so, so he's going to be good. <laughs> he's yeah. going to kill it. It's, it's going to be amazing. It's going to work out. Yeah, if you ever get a chance, go check out the 2009 Chivas USA roster. It was fantastic. Uh, and Chivas USA failed, and that's, that's, that's all I'll say there. But Paulo Nagamura, I, I just am not excited about the hire. Like, I just – I'm really – there's nothing about Paolo Nagamora outside of, you know, a very great playing career that I'm going to turn to and be like, this is the dude that I want to leave, leave my brand new kind of generation of, of the organization that we're in. Um, this is the dude who now that we're in the largest kind of competition where we are locally with Austin, brand new selling out stadiums, Verde, all that Dallas going and developing players and selling them for $20 million overseas Paolo Nagamore is the guy who's going to make us compete with Dallas and Austin. That's not, that's just not what I see. I don't know. I, I don't want to shit on Paolo Nagamore too much. I, I really liked him as a player. You know, I think he is a, I, I felt like he was a strong USL championship manager and I like that a lot, but I just don't know if coming into the ma- the managerial level right now in his career is the move for him to, to be successful, is the move for, for Houston to be successful. They're, I, I don't know. It, it, it's a very high risk, but right with, with high risk parties, comes, awesome. comes high reward at the same exact time. Um, could he turn around? Could he be kind of what we're seeing, kind of tying back to, you know, what I, what I started off the podcast with, with the NFL, the NFL is going with these young head coaches who are, you know, flashy and, and super, you know, ha- have these new styles and these, these new tactics that are winning games. Could Nagamura be a dude like that coming into MLS? Sure. He could be, but could he be the next tab Ramos to fail out in two years and Houston's <laughs> back in the same situation two years later after <laughs> Dallas has developed four more players and sold them for $10 million dollars each in Austin, you know, is is the biggest market in Texas. Probably, you know, like so like that's just where I'm concerned. I feel like if you're a brand new ownership, you're saying you're gonna spend all this money, you bring a club legend back to to be the general manager of of the club, like you have to turn around and like really I would prefer, right? This is me, not not everyone else. I would prefer you turn around and make a splash of a head coach hire. Uh, Even if it's a guy who is a little less unproven, but still a name out there, I think you got to go do it. That's just my opinion, but we'll see, right? At the end of the day, just like um, the Trundle hire, we can only judge Nagamura with the product he puts out on the field. And who knows, maybe Houston turns around and, and, you know, they, they pull an RSL from 2021 and they make a Western Conference final out of nowhere. And, and I'm sitting here looking like a dumbass because well, we all looked like a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all um, we all were on that one. Is there any other <laughs> comments about Torondolo, Nagamora, Houston, LAFC that you guys want to chat about before we get into the I think that the two players that are going to be a fun, fun time to talk about this episode? I do have a comment that popped in my head that is completely yes. unrelated. That's fine. So uh, remember when we did that prediction show before 2021? Yes. How did I do? Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, none of us did that well. That's all I'll say. You did the best in picking players to win awards. Yeah, that's what I wanted you to say. Got gotcha. you. I, I, I know what you wanted. I know what you wanted. All right. Let's talk about <laughs> um, actual news going on, Jason. Let's talk about actual news. You said I'm news. the best? Um, there, what? There, okay. <laughs> you are the best, man. Um, yes. And if you guys are watching <laughs> the YouTube uh, or the, the Twitch, uh, Daryl DK and Ricardo Pepe did get their tickets to Europe. Um, finally, Daryl DK got the permanent move to, to Europe. We'll, we'll start with the DK transfer because um, it's, it's a little less fun than the Ricardo Pepe transfer. But Orlando City have sold striker Daryl DK to West Brom in um, currently playing in the EFL Championship. So DK going back to the championship where, you know, he had all of his fun rise and success with Barnsley. Now he's just going back. Uh, now he's just going back for playing for West Brom. Um the deal was nine and a half million dollars to West uh, to Orlando City from West Brom with a twenty percent sell on fee, which I think is probably the nicest part about this entire deal. Um, Vaughn, I'll turn it to you. The big man Dal DK going back to England, going back to the championship, gonna go back and he's gonna lead West Brom to promotion to to the EPL, right? Uh, I <laughs> he absolutely could. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm so happy for him. I mean, the, the biggest takeaway for me about DK is that there is still so much value to be found in the super draft. Like I talked about it with Sam a little bit last week, but, but this is a, a guy that fell, didn't he go fifth to Orlando? Like Five or six. Four, yes. Like four teams passed over him and all they had to do was pick him in the super draft and they've got a 10, 10 million, million plus <laughs> guy. Like that's a fireable offense. Like, holy moly. Right. Uh, and, and it's not like DK like came out of nowhere. Like there were a lot of people that are like, he's the best striker. He's, he's the guy to take. Um, yeah. And, and I'm happy for Orlando city. Uh, I'm happy for DK. Uh, I think there's a huge step for him. I think uh, especially if he can push uh, West Brom over the top and get into the premiership. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd be so happy. I, I think we're all going to be having our eyes on West Brom and, and how they finish out their campaign. Uh, and, and I wish him all the success. Uh, this, this is, this is what's going to make the league stronger and better, right? It's, it's, will, it's us having yeah. guys that come into MLS, develop here, that, that can follow that pathway and are now really getting scouted and can have success when they leave here. That's that's the ultimate goal. Uh, and that's yeah. how we're going to grow our league. So, yeah, pumped pumped about it for DK. 100%. I think, you know, if you're Daryl DK, you're going back to the league where you absolutely skyrocketed your stock. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the EFL championship's not known for its best defending, right? So at the end of the day, DK is going to have to probably, you know, at some point develop into a little bit more of a of a striker with better defending around him. But if he's going out to the championship and he's scoring, you know, fucking I don't know, 10, 10 plus goals for the second half of the season, and he leads West Brom to a playoff promotion and then potentially a, a promotion to the EPL. I mean, that's fantastic, right? He almost did it with the Barnsley side. That, that was nowhere near as talented as this West Brom side is. So um, not that I know that much about West Brom. I just know West Brom way more talented than Barnsley of last year. <laughs> but Jason, I'll turn it to you. I mean, DK, nine and a half million, 20% sell on. That's sick. Going right into what you said, Barnsley's currently sitting in 23rd, one spot <laughs> out with 14 points on the season. Maybe um, they should have bought DK. They're the second worst team in the league. And when he was there, they were pretty damn good, right? I'm pretty sure they made the playoffs. They finished know. fourth, I think. Yeah, so they would have made the playoffs because I think yeah. three, four, yeah, three through six. West Brown's currently fourth in those playoff spots. Um, so I think this is an amazing move because he, he's going to instantly be able to go into a league that he's already been in. He's semi comfortable with it because he killed it there. Um, yeah. And He's in a position to get promoted and then be in the Premier League in like, I don't know, 15 games. Is so, it the same manager too? At West Brom? That that was with him at Barnsley? Is I don't it? Know. I, I didn't know, know that. that <laughs> I do not know. <laughs> I will research. Sure Keep talking, Jason. Um, but that right there is reason enough to be excited about this because, sure, maybe some people aren't huge, super high on the championship. Um, but – the fact that this team is actually playing very well without DK and they're going to add DK into that mix. And then he can, you know, if he can find that form that he had, you know, on his last spell, like you said, with a, a, a significantly worse team, then I see no reason why that team can't get promoted and why he, he couldn't be in the premier league next season. And even if he, you know, even if they're only in the premier league for a season, that's still a really valuable amount of time for him to be playing against, you know, very, very high quality center backs and, you know, top, top Liverpool, um, Manchester United, you know, I was going to say Arsenal, but you know, we all know what that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I'm actually really excited about it because I don't know. I, I think it's fun. I like the championship. I, I just enjoy its, you know, scrappiness. Um, but I, I mean, I'm happy for him. I mean, it's a huge move and, in Orlando City gets money that they desperately need. Yeah, so one thing I want to say is that, Yvonne, you are correct. It is the same manager that finished up at Barnsley the second half of last oh, year. Um, Gerhard, Gerhard Struber, Red Bull manager, was the manager at Barnsley before that. And this new manager, Valerian, uh, Valerian Ismael, probably butchered the shit out of that. I'm sorry. Um, but he <laughs> finished up at Barnsley. You should look it up on uh, how to pronounce <laughs> <names. laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, finished up at Barnsley the second half of the season. Now West Brom manager picking up the guy who pushed him into a playoff promotion spot it makes a ton of sense. Um, but yes, very happy for DK. He's going to kill it. I mean, I, he has to kill it. I think he's he's a known commodity now there. So so having the same manager there. is like amazing. Right. Yeah, like, it's a lot he of already trust. knows how to use DK, and DK already feels comfortable in, in his system. So, did you see the um, DK getting um, welcomed by the fans at West Brom's latest home game? It was going around Twitter for a little bit. If you go onto West Brom's Twitter account, there there was DK walking out. Like he's known around like championship clubs. Like he's a known commodity. Like fans are happy about it. I, I just I, I love seeing it. That's my the, favorite the, thing to do. Is like when an American scores in the team tweets it out i go yeah. and look at the comments to try and find the ones from like the actual fans and i'm like oh yeah this is cool <laughs> not someone just shitting on an american just someone like or yeah, like, like an actual. american just being hyped like one of us being super excited <laughs> that they scored because they're american but actually someone who only cares because they want their team to win is, is fun. yes because they've been a west brom fan since 1980 and yeah all that yeah, fun yeah. stuff Exactly. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is the business deal for for Orlando in this sense, right? Orlando, I think, you know, has been known as a club to hang on to talent too long, losing out on a transfer fee because talent gets a little upset. I know at the end of the day, they, they ended up selling Kyle Lahren. Um, I don't think they got the money they could have got for Kyle Lahren. Um, you know, probably he's what the largest talent to come out of Orlando or out of Orlando city since um, DK Chris Mueller. We can look at that situation. He got fed up with, with the ownership and he kind of took upon himself to, to go on a free to Hibs. Um, but Orlando city finally got it right. They weren't going to get 20 million or 18 million that they were suggesting for DK, but they got, you know, roughly 10 million with a 20% of sell on fee. And the sell on ten. Is- yeah, the selling is, is very nice, especially it's if they do make the Premier League. And because I think about it like this, like Oscar Pereja is the manager of Orlando City. We know what Oscar Pereja does. We, he, you know, he works with youngsters very well. And you know, I think with things going well with MLS Next Pro, you have Pereja in charge. You have a very hot um, talent market in Orlando. Twenty percent sell-on fee could feed your your academy for the next. 10 years if, if you really if you really needed it to right so i just really like the business savvy that orlando seems to finally have in, in, in a move and i'm happy that they didn't kind they of still kind out. of held out a little bit i mean they did maybe a little but look at the end of the day they got they got a they got a very good deal for DK. Yeah. um is there anything else that you guys want to mention about dk orlando city maybe USMNT stuff with him. I don't know. Like, do you think this really skyrockets him over, over a few other guys that we have in the striker pool right now? Or, you know, I think it depends it, on how he does. Yeah. Cause if he goes back His out and scores is, like yeah. he did, he yeah. can easily get himself, you know, back in top of that conversation. Yeah. yeah I mean, you were talking about his value going up. If, if they make premier league, I, I think it's almost the other way around. I, I think it's, if, if he's this guy that's tearing up, uh, the English championship and can still score 15, 20 goals. Uh, and, and then they don't get promoted. Right. <laughs> then there's going to be some of those lower end premier league teams that are looking at yeah. him and saying, he's, he's going to be the guy we need to grab. Right. Like yeah, right now, he's be in the premier league. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, but, but I agree. It's, it's great business for, for Orlando. It kind of controls their spending too, right? Like yeah. <laughs> they're going to get this 9.5 mil. And then if, if, and when there's a future sale, which I think there's a real likelihood of, uh, then, then all of a sudden they're going to get to reap the, the rewards down the road too. So it can feed their future too. Maybe, maybe they can finally win so a trophy much. at some point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I like sell on fees. Uh, I think more MLS teams should do that. Yes. I, I think that MLS teams are starting to catch upon that. I think Dallas has, has again, you know, I, we can talk about Dallas's transfers left and right, and we're going to talk about a Dallas transfer, but I think that they've done a very good job at um, making sure that they get paid in the future for, for their developments. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing, the last thing I want to quickly say about Orlando is that now Orlando has to replace the attacking front of Nani, DK, and Chris Mueller. Good luck with that, Orlando City. You have 
like less than two months to start making some moves. Dallas, <laughs> FC they Dallas. Got your bank accounts. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, you got, got more cash now. <laughs> um, so let's talk about, I guess, I mean, look, the DK move is huge. I love it. I don't want to downgrade that, but I want to talk about maybe the, the more pricey, the more flashy news of Dallas selling uh, Ricardo Pepe to Bundesliga side, a, a FC Augsburg. Um, obviously we know Pepe's meteoric rise in 2021 and MLS all-star MLS young player of the year, getting, um, his first caps for the U S M and T picking the U S M and T scoring a ton of goals, right? Like Pepe, him and DK, I think 2021 was just an absolute roller coaster uh, of emotions probably for them, but they absolutely rose their stock, you know, uh, just so much in, in, in the past year. He gets sold from Dallas to Augsburg for a total package. So there, I didn't see much breakdown of what the package looks like, but it was a total package, uh, according to Fabrizio Romano, of $20 million, which is going to be an FC Dallas record transfer. And there has been a lot of big names coming out of Dallas in the past few years. So, Jason, I'll start with you. Pepe to Augsburg, Pepe to the Bundesliga, $20 million. I mean, <laughs> go with whatever you want to go with on in that topic right there. I mean, it is amazing, right? Like, this is a guy, like you said, meteoric rise. He came, sprang onto the scene um, for the U.S. men's national team. He was awesome. For Dallas, he was banging in goals. He He's been very consistent, and he's – a massive threat every single time he's on the field. So I think we all kind of realized this was a matter of time. Um, and it was kind of coming, I don't know, maybe a couple months ago for some people, but like, it, it just seemed like this was an, a logical move, but $20 million is a huge sum and it comes with a lot of pressure. So I'm not, I, I'm very happy for him. It's just like, I really hope that, this is, you know, going to work out. I, I don't want to sound negative because I'm not like, this is awesome. <laughs> but but um, I think he's going to go to the Bundesliga. I think he has a huge potential to rise even higher. I mean, if they're, I don't know where, where they are right now in Bundesliga. They're table. in, they're at the bottom of the table right now. Last time I checked, like 15. Like bottom, bottom? Oh. oh yeah. 15. Like relegation battle bottom. Okay. Well, yeah. So if he helps them stay up, I mean, that's a springboard. I like to look at these moves as sort of stepping stones into, into their careers. Um, and to me, this is a very logical stepping stone, but if they do get, you know, relegated, I kind of don't want him to be there anymore. Like, I, I don't want him to be in Bundesliga, too. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can agree with you there. I, I the, the move we all saw Josh I'm, Sargent, so yeah, 100% fair. I, the move reminds me a little bit of like Gianluca Busio and Tanner Tessman, two guys who were going to a you know, at what everyone predicted was going to be a bottom tier uh Serie A squad mm -hmm. and look at. Venezia can still get relegated, but two guys who I think everyone was hoping impressed enough were another Serie A team, another club around Europe was like, let's go sign that dude to a recently relegated Venezia squad. Like, right, I feel like that's what a lot of people was uh, were thinking about the Venezia move for for Testament and Buccio. Um, but this could be something like that. I do hope that he comes in. He's the striker that saves the second half of the season yeah. and he keeps Augsburg up in the Bundesliga and Augsburg does have that reputation of consistently being at least a top 10 side in Germany. But Vaughn, Pepe going to, to Augsburg, I mean, we can say it a hundred times. It's a huge move. It's a big deal. It's insane. It's crazy. What were your initial thoughts when you saw Pepe kind of getting that, that deal? A, a German Bundesliga team just spent $20 million <laughs> on an 18 year old American <laughs> to help them stay up. Yeah. Let me say that again. A German team just spent $20 million on an 18-year-old American while they're in a relegation battle to try and stay up. That That is significant for Major League Soccer and for American players and how they're perceived, especially if Pepe is successful when he makes it to Augsburg. And I see no reason yeah. why he can't be. Mm -hmm. Th this is that next evolution of the league, right? Like this is going to be, this is the first story of many. Right. <laughs> this is and I say first story. It's not really right. Like we've got the no, Alfonso that's... Davies going to uh, uh, Bayern Munich and becoming a best 11 player. And and now you're going to have guys like this. You got Pulisic going for 73 million to Chelsea. Like 
the perception of Americans abroad is changing. And I think also for the U.S. men's national team, it is true. Like getting these guys minutes in Europe is going to be very important for the U.S. men's national team taking that next step. And yeah. having guys like Pepe, having guys like DK, having guys like Pulisic, McKenney, all making it to these big clubs and 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 playing, getting real minutes, uh, and being parts of the future plans for these big clubs. That 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 was my initial reaction. Is that this is fantastic? Once again, for player, for team, for country, yeah. every single level. What what's not to be pumped about? I, that's the crazy part is that for both of these moves, DK and Pepe, it's like everyone wins. Like both MLS clubs got a crazy amount of money back and, and they're going to love it. Both players got an opportunity to really prove themselves, push themselves in a direction for their club career, for their international career. And the USMNT, the fans, the program, everything like that is going to have their players stepping up, playing in a new, you know, limelight, new pressures, you know, better talent, whatever you want to say. Right. Like, you have these just so many wins across the board. Like it sucks that we're not going to see D uh, DK and Pepe um, like play week in and week out in major league soccer next season. But you know, it's also going to be pretty cool when we see, when we see Pepe scoring a shit ton of goals in Germany and DK killing it in, in, in the championship. Right. Like, like those are the moments that I think us fans in general, whether you're a fan of whatever MLS team, like you can sit back and you can be like, that's one of ours. Like that's cool as shit. And that's where I feel like, you know, you can talk about any of the moves in the past three years, whether they were big name, small name, big transfer fee, no transfer fee, Ricardo Pepe size transfer fee. It's just th these are the moves that really are going to help create American soccer development and major league soccer development, which will in turn help American soccer development. But yeah. Well, well, well it also resets the, the evaluation on American talent, yeah. right? Like John Luca Busio was just sold for what, like 4 million or whatever. And his transfer market value now, like he goes to Syria, plays for like 15 games, and his market value is now $11 million. He just yeah. sold for $4 million, and now he's $11 million. He was still an $11 million player just playing in MLS. Nobody valued him at that, right? But now that they see that experience in Syria, oh my goodness, this guy's worth a ton. Well, this is the exact this is how you have a guy like Pepe that now at 18, they say, no, he's skilled. He's talented. He's good in MLS. He's going to be good in Germany. Yeah. $20 million. We can get him at 20 million. And he's eventually going to turn into a 30, 40, $50 million player. Well, if that's the future of, of the, no, but, but that's what I'm saying is I think that's, yeah, you're right. the, the, the more that these moves happen, the more, the more that these guys go over and are successful and it changes the perception of American technical yeah. ability scoring ability and that they can hang with the guys in germany italy and england and spain and france and all those places that's that's what's going to make the sport grow domestically uh and and, and put some respect on uh, american talent and i i think this is a big step in the right direction yeah exactly and and i think it's even bigger for american soccer because i feel like a lot of players uh a lot of fans media whatever it may be praise the Alfonso Davies deal to Bayern Munich, right? And, and yes, Augsburg isn't uh, isn't Bayern. But at the end of the day, Augsburg's a big Bundesliga side and Pepe's American. Yeah, Davies is Canadian, right? Like Canadians are going to have that. They're going to love it. And they should because if Alfonso Davies was American, I would be talking about Alfonso <laughs> Davies every day of the week if I possibly could. But Ricardo Pepe's ours. He's American and he is going to, like you said, Vaughn, I think definitely shape how Americans are perceived because Ricardo Pepe's technical ability is some of the best that I've seen in a teenager. Like we can talk about like tons of teenagers that have come through American soccer, MLS, whatever it may be. Ricardo Pepe's just pure technical ability and his finishing is, is some of the best that I feel like I've seen. I'm not saying I've sat here and watched soccer for 30 years. I haven't, I'm not even 30, but you know, at the end of the day, like, He's really good. I think technically he's really good, and that's going to translate well, especially in the Bundesliga. Anything else we want to say about Pepe, DK, anything like that before we get into some of the more minor news um, and transfers around Major League Soccer? That's good. All right, cool. Let's move on. Jason, tossing it to you. Yep. Get that website up because we are going to talk about again, <laughs> I just some, of the, some of the more <laughs> – 
Vaughn, I like the way Vaughn, I like the way you worded it last episode. These are not less important deals um, that have gone around Major League Soccer. They're just not as notable, so we're going to spend a little less time on them. But Jason, you brought up one signing that you wanted to talk about a little bit. Yeah, and it's for uh, you know my home team, the Chicago Fire. Um, <laughs> they not, uh, not the Timbers, not the Timbers. They signed uh, center back Rafael uh, Shihas from Bundesliga side Kohn. Cone? I don't know. I, you know what? I'm not going to say all these teams that he played for because they all are way too many <laughs> German names. Um, but basically, he's had a pretty long career. Um, I think he's 33, I want to say. I didn't look it up. But I think he's either 31 or 33. But basically, um, I'm really excited about this because it's a it's just like a TAM deal. It's not some major deal. It's not like there's going to be this huge pressure on him to perform and everyone's going to be looking at him to be the major, major player on the team. But he's also a guy who all last season is defending against guys like Robert Lewandowski. So um, I am really excited because, you know, we, we need this. <laughs> we need a solid, you know, he, he can pair. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but basically he's going to come in and he's going to be really solid for us, I think. Um, and it's a move that, this is the first move that Ezra's made as manager. Yes. Um, and it seems like, you know, every time we make a move like this, I get excited. So I'm trying to keep my hopes a little bit in check, but I'm excited. Like, I just think he, he's going to come in. He's going to be a solid center back in MLS. I am hopeful. And I think that we need to make a lot more signings, <laughs> but you know, this is a really good step in the right direction. I mean, look, I think TAM level center backs are very, very strong roster plays. Obviously, the talent and performance has to be there. But usually when we see TAM level center backs, hopefully, you know, like head coaches have the right perception of talent and that that can translate well. Um, he is 31 years old, Jason, just to clarify yeah, that so there for you. Not that old. And he's coming from the Bundesliga, right? I know he's he's apparently had a long career in, in the two, two Bundesliga yeah. and everything like that. But he has been a leader for for Köln this Bundesliga season um, on their first season back in the in the first division in Germany. And I was reading reports that apparently they weren't super happy to let him go. But you know, Köln also they need some cash too because they just got promoted. They're not. It's not like you know they're Bayern running around there. But I like the move. Like apparently, there's a lot of positive reports coming out of him, um, out of Germany about him. And I mean. Tam level, if you compare him up next to like Mauricio Pineda or someone like that, yeah. you know, I think that that that's the start in the right direction for Ezra Hendrickson and and, and the fire. Vaughn, bon, you have a very confused look on your face and it's been throwing me <laughs> off. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was trying to compartmentalize. I'm looking at the notes showing that he's got 47 goals and 27 assists as a yeah. center back. Yeah. I don't I can't say I've watched the guy play, but holy cow, he's got to be getting onto some set pieces or getting involved in attack. Even in 400 games, getting 47 goals and 27 assists as a center back, that is nuts. Well, I was looking, I was trying to see, like, has he only been a center back? Was he playing, like, on the wing? Like, is he converted from somewhere? No. He, from it looks what like, I know, he's always been a center back. That's impressive. So, yeah, that's something I'm very and curious to see. That's something we can use. <laughs> that's something you could use. <laughs> Honestly, I'm, set set piece Defense and offense is something the fire are really not good at. And if he can help that even a little bit, just a tiny bit better, it, I'd be ecstatic because we're God awful at it. You know how many times I, I held my breath on set pieces that the other team scored every single time. Yeah. But no, a, that's, that's, that's what man. I'm looking at. He's, he's going to replace Robert Barrett's goals right there, 47 and 27. Holy moly. <laughs> Throw him up that's top. actually not Throw that hard to do at this point. <laughs> Um, no, he's a big guy, he's six foot two. Um, so I mean, that look that always helps. If he's like you know, your version of Walker Zimmerman, I mean, you can't really complain, right? Not that I'm gonna say this guy's coming in day one and he's a MLS Defender of the Year candidate. I You're mean, telling Jason, me he's an sure MLS Defender of the Year, <laughs> yeah, exactly what I'm saying. Me, I'm but trying to keep he, my hopes in check, and then you pull that shit. <laughs> If he's a big bodied center back that will get on the end of some set pieces and be dangerous for you there, that's always nice, right? You know, I mean, I know that from New York City last year being pretty dangerous on set pieces. It's it's, it's pretty mean, nice you can to just have, defend so. one on one as well and just like stop people. <laughs> yeah, anything that he's decent at will be better than what we had. <laughs> 
help out uh, Slonina and Ned a little bit, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, so he doesn't have to he make 15 saves a game. Although that's yeah. helping his stock quite a bit. <laughs> Our shittiness has actually made him look really good. <laughs> we want to talk about stock rising. <laughs> <laughs> talk about a um, meteoric rise. <laughs> Vaughn, you had less of a player and I feel like more of a situation that you wanted to talk about. So I'll, I'll throw that to you. Yeah, so Miami is making moves, right? Like, I think we all knew heading into the season that uh, Miami was in a tough financial spot because of their previous mismanagement. And Chris Henderson was brought in from Seattle to right the ship. And they are clearing the books this offseason. Uh, they they loaned out Carranza to Philadelphia, which we talked about last week. Uh, and then this week, uh, we've had two big news things. It sounds like Blaze Matwitty is going to be gone. And he's going to be out. Uh, and then they've also, uh, in addition to that, they've sent out, um, they've loaned Rodolfo Pizarro back to Monterey, where he came from in Liga MX, no with an option DPs. to buy. So so they're clearing DPs off the books. I think, from my understanding, is that Pizarro still would impact the salary cap? So for- they can't, you can't sign a DP in replace of Carranza and Pizarro their like their status still stays on the roster and it impacts the salary so it's not like loaning out these two guys is going to mean that's bringing more deep think that's not going to happen that way especially with how this hits the salary cap in certain aspects this is definitely a play for 2022 to clear up salary space hoping that philly and monterey buy them from their loan option and that in 2023 they have dp spots open 100 percent but Sorry, still, it's impressive to... work <laughs> to get them off the books to to be to be working in that direction uh, for for writing a bad situation. Uh, and Miami is quickly going to be going into their second second iteration. Uh, th- those yeah. are losing both Pizarro, Matuidi. Those are significant by themselves. Uh, obviously, they already moved Lewis Morgan this off season, uh, and and really their only incoming move, which was also this week, was Bryce Duke. Uh, getting him from LAFC for a hundred thousand in GAM, um, so that's that's really what I wanted to talk about was just Miami making these moves to to really try and correct uh, a really rough situation. I think they've done a really good job this off season doing that, uh, and they're going to look very different. And I think they could be a contender for Wooden Spoon next year. <laughs> Uh, Jason, I have something I just want to mention about Bryce Duke, but before I get into that, the whole Inter Miami situation, if you have anything you want to comment on that, please go for it while I while I just look at something real quick. Yeah, I mean, Miami, I, I kind of feel like they came out to the league with massive aspirations and just kind of tripped over themselves by making poor decisions repeatedly. And, you know, the whole DP situation kind of blew up in their face, which... I don't know how they didn't see that coming, but uh, like Vaughn said, a lot of changes, hopefully for the best. And this is opening up spots Um, and this is not going to turn it around quick, but I mean, they've definitely dug themselves a pretty deep hole that they're now starting to try and get out of. And it's just going to take some time. What you're going to see from Inter Miami in 2022 is definitely Vaughn, definitely wooden spoon contenders. 100% agree with you there, but they are going to play like Cincinnati's a small. <laughs> <laughs> they are going to play like a small market club in a big market. That's exactly what it is. They're going to rely a lot on domestic players, a lot on guys who are going to be filling out the back half of those rosters on any other MLS team to play major minutes, right? Like Bryce Duke was a back half of the roster guy at LAFC. They just traded $100,000 in GAM to get him. Though I do have to say, I'm a huge fan of Bryce Duke. I think for the past two years, I've picked him as a young player who is going to step into the spotlight and take that huge next step forward. He hasn't, um, just because I think the depth chart has been a little loaded at LAFC, so I'm hoping the move to Miami gets gets him some more MLS minutes. But you look at the moves that that Miami has made, right? Bryce Duke, Ariel Lassiter, re-signing Victor Uloa. Um, I really think the only quote-unquote big flashy move that they've made this offseason is going down to to Brazil and and getting uh, Jean Mata or Jean Mata, how, however you say his name. Um, but they've really gone out and they're going after 
kind of mid to low level MLS rostered guys. And then they're going to expect a lot of them to, to play a lot of minutes. And I think that's just a, you know, kind of a filler year. And like I said before, until 2023 can hit, they have some kind of cap space open, a DP um, space open, probably, you know, just more room for, for bigger talent there. But it's interesting what's going on down in Miami. Definitely that that five DP. I think MLS did the right thing in punishing them with the five DP <laughs> situation they had going on. But you really don't see the larger impact until you really look at roster construction. You can sit down in an off season and really see, I think, what's going on down there in uh, in South Beach. Um, the last move that I want to quickly talk about, and there were a lot of moves this week, a lot of moves specifically today that had my fingers typing a little fast to get Instagram posts up. Um, just, you know, a lot of good moves, right? Cincinnati signing Dominique Baji as a free agent. I love it. I love that Cincinnati's actually done this offseason. DC signing Brendan Hines Ike um, on a permanent deal. Um, it's because he was on loan last year, bringing him in on a perm deal. But I think the move that I really want to talk about is Nashville SC going out, signing Sean Davis from free agency. Um, obviously, you know, Davis coming over from the, from the Red Bulls, played his entire career with the Red Bulls, came up through the, the, the Red Bull 2 system and everything like that. You know, won a lot in USL, came to MLS, won two supporter shields with the Red Bulls, over 200 games played in, in the Red Bull system. Like, Sean Davis is what, you know, at, at this point in his career – is a high-end MLS American starter. Like he is a domestic starter, and that's what you're getting out of Sean Davis. And Nashville SC has run their entire organization and won a lot of games through this style, through the style of domestic talent that you're going to bring in, that you're going to have start, and you're going to have do well, right? You look at Dax McCarty. I mean, I know Annabelle Godoy isn't domestic, but he's been in Major League Soccer for a while, right? I think he has his green cards. So Sure, te technically domestic. You look at just guys like that, Joe Willis, Walker Zimmerman, guys like that who are just high-level MLS talents that are not the super flashy, sexy names. But guess what? You pair all of them up with Hani Mukhtar and you're in the Eastern Conference Final, you know, like whatever, maybe two years ago and then um, last year playing in the semifinal. So Nashville, just they know how to operate in a smaller market, which, you know, it, which I think – Someone like Cincinnati should definitely take a take a look at, um, and they just they just know how to operate with with the cash and how they're moving money in the off season. I just I just love how they do it. This is more of a move to kind of praise Nashville and not really talk about Sean Davis. But I don't know if you guys have any opinions on Nashville or, or the Sean Davis sign. Go for it if if you do. Um, I mean, I think it's just like calculated move. Like it seems like Nashville really knows their style, knows what they want, and goes out and gets people that they want and they feel confident are going to come in and immediately have an impact in a you know a winning way. So yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. I like how they do business, you know. Smart. They definitely they definitely know how to do business. Uh Vaughn, anything about that or any other move quickly we you you, you want to touch on before we close things up. Well, no, I think it's huge for Nashville. I mean, I talked about briefly them and, and how savvy they've been this offseason, really, really since they started. Uh, Mike Jacobs is going to be one of those guys that is going to be highly coveted as a an front office executive in this league for years to come. I, I think he has shown his chops being able to do it solo uh, in Nashville and, and what he's done. I mean, here, you're getting Sean Davis on a free. Like, like you're not... He's a free agent. You're not spending a dime of gam getting him into an already good locker room. You, I mean, this is another one of those Red Bulls captains making the move, right? Yeah. Uh, and and with <laughs> two, two of them on the now. roster now. I mean, yeah. it's wild. <laughs> um, for Sean Davis, it, I'm s sad to see him go from Red Bulls, right? Like he he was one of those staples. I I think we talked about this, like the the Wondolowskis, the Beckermans, the those guys that are with a team like for their entire career, right? Like yeah. I don't see that being like a common thing in the future. And so that's where it's sad to see a guy like Sean Davis go is like, no, he's been there forever. Uh, he's been a staple with Red Bulls and and now he's going to Nashville and and hopefully he can continue uh, for several years there. Um, it's going to be weird seeing him in another Jersey. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, Nashville, great business for them. Red Bulls. I don't know how you let your captain walk like that. 
I mean, they do it year after year. You know, they're they're getting pretty good at letting the letting the captain walk. And apparently, um, Sean Davis turned down a larger contact, a larger contract with the Red Bulls to become a free agent to kind of pick where he wanted to go. So, but that maybe that's a, little, a situation yeah, too, right? A little telling, a little telling of what's kind of going on with those Red Bulls up in New Jersey, actually probably like ten miles from here, um, <laughs> but. Guys, um, this has been a fun episode. Thank you for for obviously sitting down recording another podcast with me. Um, Vaughn and Jason, Happy New Year's to the listeners. Happy New Year's as well. If you guys want to learn a little bit more about us, head over to MLSAces.com. Check that out. Also, thank you to Soccer90 again for sponsoring this episode. Again, Soccer90.com, promo code MLSAces. Check them out. Get yourself something cool. Thank you, guys. We are going to be officially moving recording days for 2022 moving forward as of right now um, to Tuesdays. So two days like tonight with the drop day on Wednesday. So just giving that little note there as well. Thank you, guys. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk again next week.